Greetings respective viewers, I'm George from Ireland. So here I am on Smith Square in London and behind me is the house where Sir Oswald Mosley of unhappy and inglorious memory formerly resided. It's this door here above my finger. Number eight, if, if I recall correctly. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Sir Oswald is uh, notorious for having been a leader of the British Union of Fascists and National Socialists. Uh, he was not knighted by the monarch, he inherited a baronetcy. So um, Sir Oswald's family had been prominent um, in the West Midlands of England for several centuries. Uh, so they, they'd been landed gentry prior to them getting that, uh, get, get that baronetcy. That's why it was Sir Oswald Mosley, not Mr Oswald Mosley. So it was the, the eldest son, only the eldest inherited it. And they had, they had a family seat somewhere um, uh, in the West Midlands. He was born in 1896 and he went to a Winchester College, which is um, um, perhaps ironic because that college uh, is a renowned secondary school um, known for producing um, many Liberal and Labour MPs, um, civil servants and so on. No one of note really in the last um, uh, 10 or 20 years. There's one Hollywood actor, I forget his name, he can't be that famous. Anyway. Um, so, um, Mosley, I, I read his imaginatively entitled autobiography, My Life. Uh, it does exactly what it says on the tin, I can at least say that for him. Uh, and he said that there, there was a lot of um, Ganymede behaviour going on there and he found that completely unappetising. So, he wasn't that academic, he was much more of a sportsman and so there was a lot of hearty sports playing going on, he was into fencing, boxing and so on. You could say this, he was, he was fearless. So then he went up to Sandhurst, the Royal Military Academy. It's a two-year course to train to be an officer in those days. These days, despite you know, being much more technological, it's only one year. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> Mosley recalled how sometimes they'd have time off, leave all the shot, where Sandhurst is, go up to London by train, hardly anybody had a car back then, and go to the Empire Music Hall, get absolutely exhausted, and manage to come back to, to Sandhurst after midnight. The, the sergeants who'd been um, drilling them would put them to bed as though they were, as though these these um, cadets were babies and the sergeants were nannies. The same person who'd be beasting him on the parade ground the next day. Um, so he was uh, hadn't quite completed his course when the First World War broke out, and he volunteered uh, for the army full time. And they were just they were just commissioned straight away, even though they hadn't completed their course. He had far more military training than most people, and so he fought on the on the Western Front. And he was completely unafraid of death. Later, he joined the Royal Flying Corps. He was then part of the army. It was only on April Fool's Day 1918 that the Royal Air Force, as such, was created. Um, and you really had to be courageous to be in the, the uh, Royal Flying Corps at that time because uh, uh, flying was in its infancy. It was very rudimentary. And even without fighting, there were so many crashes. So some of them, some of them died um, very young. So he was really stacking the odds against himself. But anyway, he survived. He had some sort of injury in the First World War. And I always wonder whether he'd sustained a head injury, which meant that he was mentally out of kilter. He certainly seemed maladjusted, was always a bit swivel-eyed, like, um, had, he, had he undergone a personality change? <clears throat> but that was that. He recalled the aeroplane song that the officers used to sing, sort of gallows humor about some um, Air Force uh, officer who's shot down and gets completely mangled, come down, comes down in various bits, a way to, take the sting out of it, the idea that they might meet a very premature and a very violent death, as indeed many of them did. So the war ended and he, he stood for Parliament as a Conservative in the Harrow constituency. But as he indicated at the time, he was one of the hard-faced young men of 1918. He saw himself not really as, as representing a party, but the war generation, so that was that. And he had spoken about um, restricting um, immigration. There really wasn't very much immigration at the time. Um, um, and he was an early ally of, of Nancy Astor, the first woman to take a seat in the House of Commons. She was a Conservative elected for Plymouth. She, she took that seat when her husband was elevated to the peerage, therefore couldn't be in the Commons. Of course, Countess Markovitch of Sinn Féin was elected to the House of Commons, but refused to take um, an oath of allegiance to His Britannic Majesty. So although Countess Markovitch was elected first, she didn't take a seat. Um, so he was, a conservative, he was a conventional Conservative not for very long. And despite the railing against aliens, he had no problem with Mrs. Astor being there, despite her being from the United States. Um, anyway, uh, so then there was this conflict uh, in Ireland at the time, and the Royal Irish Constabulary Special Reserve was raised from ex-servicemen um, from Great Britain, almost always, to fill the depleted ranks of the RIC due to the depredations of the IRA. 
So they had a largely counterinsurgency role, the RIC Special Reserve, but uh, they sometimes um, overstepped the bounds of legality, used excessive force, burnt down people's houses on suspicion that they'd been um, harboring the IRA or passing them information and so forth. And, and occasionally they'd, they'd killed civilians, and very occasionally, deliberately. Well, there was a Croke Park incident, but that was to do with the auxiliaries, not the Special Reserve. Anyhow, so he denounced all this um, in the House of Commons. You ought to see the, um, the uh, biopic about him entitled Mosley, which came out in late 1997. And I actually know one of the guys who had a bit part played one of his sons. So uh, he was a, was a notorious womanizer. He married um, early the, um, uh, the, the Viceroy's daughter, and he had two sons with her, but uh, he was always philandering. Um, Anyway, so she, so she died very young, and by that time he'd been having an affair with uh, someone else, one of Lord, Lord Redesdale's daughters, one of the Mitford sisters, so married the Honourable um, Diana Mitford. And his first wife, incidentally, was a quarter Jewish, but I'm not sure if he's aware of that, because um, by the 1930s, he was a raving anti-Semite. Not quite sure where that came up, but there was a bit of anti-Semitism around, and there were these wacko conspiracy theories always saying that there was a, there was a Jewish plot to create the First World War, the, the, there were the wire pullers of the Bolsheviks, and blah, 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 and caused the Wall Street crash, and every um, <laughs> uh, disreputable and uh, spiteful kook you can imagine was heaping all the blame on our Jewish friends, scapegoating them for all of the world's woes, despite the, the Jewish people suffering just as much. Anyway, he had a further two children with, with, with his second wife, but um, he, he, he crossed the floor to be in the Labour Party for a while and was a rising star, could have been Prime Minister. But he was impatient with parliamentarianism, with his was endless hot air, and no, nothing actually got done. Um, so uh, I think it was a Smethic by-election where he, where he famously um, uh, stood when he, under his own banner, the BUF, I'll come to that a bit later. So he's Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and he was worried that the, the Labour Party was too preoccupied with bourgeois respectability, wouldn't really grasp the nettle and take the necessary action to reduce unemployment. He professed his uh, compassion for the impecunious. Why not give away your wealth then? He'd fallen out very badly with his father who made certain disobliging remarks about him in various newspapers. Said he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, he's never done an honest day's work. Um, and so on. Some newspapers felt it was a mistake of um, uh, Mosley's opponents to use his father against him, that left to his own devices he would have found, found his own nest, Sir Roswald that is. Anyway, um, he split from Labour uh, because he couldn't have all his own way on his um, very uh, drastic uh, economic programme and then he um, founded the New Party, as it was called. So some Labour MPs were very impressed by him, including Nye Bevan, and were very briefly members of that party until it became clear what direction it was taking. He thought that democracy was slipshod and there ought to be some sort of corporate government. He'd been to Italy, black shirt government, as he called it, or well, fascism to you and me, um, which he thought was far more uh, to his taste and would take um, drastic and immediate action. And he thought solved problems uh, splendidly. Um, so he didn't have much time for the freedom of the press or fair elections or things of that nature. Uh, he was very intolerant of dissent and started building a personality cult around himself. He was very physically fit, believed in taking vigorous exercise. He scorned things like playing cards, which he thought was just squandering time. Um, so these were fractious times, and there was a lot of um, argy-bargy at political rallies, both of Labour, the Conservatives, the Communist Party, to a lesser extent the Liberals. The SNP implied Cymru scarcely existed. So. I remember BBC Radio only launched in 1922, and radios were prohibitively expensive in, mo in those days. So, um, obviously there were newspapers, but a lot of people turned rallies in person. One thing, they were, they were what's the word, um, uh, they were free entertainment. Um, uh, anyway, so you had to have your heavies to prevent the thugs from the other party come and breaking up the meeting, um, heckling too much, throwing things, or um, beating up your speaker. Um, and you might indeed have um, your... Uh, Thick necks go and uh, cause mayhem in the uh, in the other political party. So there was there was havoc at times. A battle royal was often reported in the newspapers. Um, so mostly then changed the name of his party to the British Union of Fascists. He later then appended the words and National Socialists. Um, anyway, so they never managed to win a single seat in Parliament. Had his own his own newspaper called Action, and the symbol was a ring, I think, for eternity. And then the. Um, uh, the lightning bolt for, for, well, action itself, energy, all the rest of it. And uh, he started doing a fine line in anti-Semitic vitriol, having his black shirt heavies um, stomp around the east end of London, where the Jewish community mostly lived, and um, vituperate um, the, the Jewish people. And they would stand on street corners, um, shrieking the most uh, 
disgusting imprecations against uh, the Jewish community and uh, said Jewish people sometimes be aghast and called a police officer saying surely you've got to do something about this but the police officer would say quite correctly there's no law against it unless they incite violence unless they say punch a Jewish man in the face or smash the windows of a Jewish property there was no law against um, encouraging people to detest others on the basis of faith or ethnicity uh, obviously that's changed since so there was a famous the Battle of Cable Street in October 1936 where he wanted to hold a huge rally and lead it through the east end of London to the, to the Jewish area. But the Communist Party, Labour Party, Jewish groups and so on, they um, uh, got tens of thousands of people on the street to try and block him. So um, Mosley realised there'd be lots of violence, so he actually voluntarily ended it. But the thing is actually, Mosley was within his rights to do what he was doing. He was not breaking the law. The other people were breaking the law. So I'm afraid, for once, Mosley was hard done by. I know his views were detestable, but he was still permitted to express them. And so other people were, were um, denying him the right to do this. Should he have been able to do so? You could argue not, but then you'd have to change the law through a parliamentary process. Um, and not simply say, well, we don't like what you're saying, we're sort of deplatforming you. I know he's a lot worse than most people who are deplatformed. Um, so uh, he didn't get anywhere, but they, they, they did have quite a lot of money and offices in, in London and Chelsea. I think even on Whitehall, properties were rather cheap back then. Did reasonably well in places like Lancashire, the East End of London, Glasgow, Manchester, places that were suffering at the, in the time of the Great Depression. Maybe people had lost, lost faith in democracy and thought that they needed authoritarian government. Corporatism was the way forward, uh, militarism. The late 1930s had a bit of a bit of a rise in popularity when he said, um, uh, no, we must absolutely not fight over the countries like Poland. Uh, he said, um, mind Britain's business, had a big rally at Olympia. And in the early 30s, he'd received the imprimatur of the Daily Mail, something which is still thrown in the mail to this day, who published a notorious headline, Hurrah for the Black Shirts. But of course, people had no idea how badly fascism was going to end. Communism seemed to have been the major threat at that point. In the early 1930s, millions of people were being deliberately starved to death in the Soviet Union. And yes, I do mean absolutely deliberately. It was a totalitarian state with a government purported to control every single last gram of food. It was the most control-free government on earth having its spies everywhere and not allowing people out of the country and frequently denying that anyone had died of starvation and on and on and not allowing people to move even from one Union Republic to another. So knowing precisely what was going on was starving people to death, taking away food, often at gunpoint, to be exported for whatever, it's, to, 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 to buy whatever. It's not the case in a capitalist country when there's going to just be indifference from a government and the free market does what it does and the government doesn't consider it's its duty to provide. The government also doesn't consider it's duty to take food away, whereas the Soviet Union it did. So obviously, uh, communism was far crueler, far bloodier and more oppressive than fascism at this stage. Fascism became worse, it's true. Now I know that uh, the Italian fascist government was committing atrocities in Libya uh, and soon in, in, in Abyssinia, although that was scarcely reported in this country. Well, only 1935 that, that Abyssinia was, it was, it was uh, invaded. And obviously, um, Nazism in Germany didn't seem all that bad at the beginning. It soon became very bad, worse and worse. Um, but by this time, some fascists uh, well, were, were too deeply committed and felt it was too late to turn around. So one of his, one of his slogans in 1939 was, who the heck would die for Beck? An allusion to Colonel Joseph Beck, the Polish foreign minister. But uh, the war came along and he supposedly said that the United Kingdom ought to fight and his two elder sons were accepted into the British Army. Um, when his, his, his second wife had just given birth to their youngest child, Max, when in um, May 1940, they were all arrested under Regulation 18B and interned at um, Holloway Prison, formerly a, a women's prison. He was first of all put into a cell with a black prisoner, which other people thought was, was incredibly amusing, because as a white supremacist, they would find this very galling. But he said, no, I'm not racist, and I got along very well with this gentleman, though he thought the gentleman of colour should not be permitted to reside in the United Kingdom. Well, surely that is racialist. And by the way, he was an ardent imperialist. But if whites are allowed to go and live in the colonies, surely people from the colonies ought to be permitted to live in the United Kingdom. That's my view, anyhow. Uh, anyway, so um, he and his wife were allowed to, permit, allowed to live in a cottage in the grounds of the prison to hire prison, uh, prisoners as servants. So they lived in very considerable comfort. Uh, they'd just been interned, you know, Defense of the Realm Act, in extremis habeas corpus is suspended. But by 1943, he was no longer considered a, a threat and was set at liberty. But his passport wasn't returned for a few years. So he wished to live abroad, so he went to um, the south of Ireland, to um, Fomoy County Cork, later I think somewhere in Galway. Um, and the house he lived in in Fomoy still stands, because of course he didn't need a passport to go to, 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 
um, Southern Ireland in those days. Later on, he lived in Paris. A bit odd for someone who railed against immigration to be an immigrant himself. Um, but he produced my answer after the Second World War, saying it, it had definitely been wrong. And um, I don't think he completely denied the Holocaust, but he certainly trivialized it, said the six million figure was far too high. Um, but he did return to this country in the 1950s to campaign against Commonwealth immigration. Um, so he was famously defeated the Kensington by-election in 1959. In North Kensington, that's where a lot of uh, immigrants from the, the Antilles had settled near Notting Hill, the Notting Hill race riots and all that. So um, he was a thoroughly detestable man. We're obviously much better off without him. Uh, this was a time when the UK had um, more emigration than immigration, but he still thought immigration was, was a bad thing. We mustn't have race mixing. I'm very much a race mixer on a personal level. So um, he knew uh, the exiled Duke of Windsor socially in Paris. Um, Mosley, um, he, he, then, he then peppered his autobiography with the, with the term Europe a nation, believing that um, uh, all European countries should get together. Now, Europhiles don't like to hear this, but as I say, he was an ardent proponent of the European Union before it was fashionable in this country. Now, I'm not saying that most Europhiles are fascists. They aren't. But um, don't pretend me to tell me that there were no fascists were this way. Um, so uh, Christopher Hitchens said something disobliging about Lady Mosley, and Oswald wrote him a letter saying, I'm fair game, but you don't take a swipe at my wife. And um, Hitchens was reading this, and minutes later he heard in the news that, uh, that Mosley had died. Um, so, so Hitchens said, I may well be the last person he ever wrote to. Um, but he said, a deux, he was uh, incredibly urbane and charming. So if you read Hitch 22, Christopher Hitchens recalls this as uh, that he suddenly understood why the country house set were eating out of his hand and considered him a, a thoroughly clubbable chap because in certain social settings uh, he could put on a mask of someone who was very civilized, uh, bon vivant, uh, witty conversationalist and all the rest of it. Anyway, that is enough about Sir Oswald Mosley, a house which now goes for eight million pounds. So make sure you subscribe.